what may be seen as just a game is so much more under the surface. Countless stories reveal aspects of human nature that will forever remain untold. Here on Philosophspiel, we will tell those stories. This is Philosophspiel, video game philosophy. I am David Leibowitz, and time to get the spiel for your enlightenment. Game starts. Hello everyone, this is David Leibowitz with Philosophspiel, and for the first time ever, we have an actual academic with us. We have Professor Stephen Cooper. Very happy to be here with my good student and buddy David. I've heard all about his work. He's introduced me to things I don't know about, and I hope I've done the same for him. And now uh, you'll get to hear a little bit of the conversation uh, that's that's been making our lives interesting in the, in the last couple of years here at Afternoon. Yes, Dr. Stephen Cooper is a professor of religious studies, and he is expert on ancient Christianity. If you'd like to talk a little bit more about that, yeah. So, so yes, my I, I, I have modern interests too, and uh, actually, my my first career goal was to be a Jungian psychoanalyst back in my second year of college. So I got deeply drawn into the field of psychology, but as I was reading the works of C.G. Jung, he kept on saying things like. People need to know the ancient history of thought to understand where we are in the modern world. So I began studying ancient philosophy, and got so drawn into it, I kind of sidelined that career that never happened of me as a Jungian psychoanalyst, rather me as a professor of history of Christianity and getting involved in scholarship on Gnosticism, uh, esoteric trends in philosophy. Uh, plus my interest in what has happened to religion in the modern world and what is the space of spirituality that many people are finding as a way to, you know, get into some of these uh, religious and existential questions. Which we will definitely be talking about when we talk about Persona 3, as we've already talked about in the past, with um, definitely how Persona 3's story goes and a possible new answer to um, the problem of spirituality. But we're, before we go specifically into Persona 3, we are going to talk about Jung. We've done this in the past with Persona 5, but I think we we have a Jungian expert right here. We might as well give you a new re, rerun through the basics of Jung so you all know what you're talking about. Since I bring that up a lot, and I never actually talk about Jung because I talked about it once, so let's talk about it for real this time. So, C.G. Jung, Carl Jung, if we can go first name on him, uh, like all the early psychoanalysts, uh, was a doctor. Freud was a doctor. Freud began treating um, <clears throat> hysterical and other neurotic patients as a doctor uh, and discovered what he called the talking cure. And that happened in the 1880s. Uh, I talk about Freud whenever I talk about Jung because Jung was one of the early readers of Freud. Jung was a physician in Switzerland, uh, in Zurich, and he was working at a mental institution uh, dealing with severely psychotic people and hearing about their delusions. But he was also a great reader, and he started reading Freud's publications that linked uh, mental disturbances to emotionally upsetting things in childhood or to physical abuse, sexual abuse. And Freud pretty soon developed uh, the thought that it wasn't so much sexual abuse that was behind neurosis and so forth, but rather unconscious conflicts uh, about, in many cases, sexual impulses that were not expressible or could not be expressed at the time. And he devised psychoanalysis as a way to make human beings realize that we're not just rational minds, that we have instinctual bodies and impulses, and we have to come to terms with those if we're to be, you know, happy creatures. Jung was very excited about all this. He worked with Freud as very closely for 10 or 15 years, but eventually they parted ways. I think in, uh, in 1915, 1916, 1917, they'd broken already. Around the time in Los Angeles when they when Jung interpreted Freud's Freud interpreted Jung's dream about the collective unconscious, right? It was I, I thought that was in Massachusetts, but then again, this wait, is wait, not, in America. It was yeah, they were in America. They were giving uh, Freud was invited to Clark University in Worcester, Mass, uh, to to lecture, 
to, to medical students, and Jung came along with them, and both these guys were very good at languages, so they spoke English. And they, they started to have some difficulties of disagreement. And this is where Jung started developing his own ideas, moving away from Freud's emphasis upon sexuality as a source of conflict. And Jung began developing uh, his own thought that what is repressed among Western peoples, he himself was the son of a, of a Swiss pastor, a Protestant pastor, but Jung could not follow in that religious way of his father, but he realized he still had what we call spiritual issues. And Freud had uncovered how people got neurotic because of sexual issues and conflicts. Jung wanted to say, wait, sex is not the only natural impulse that relates us to other human beings and to our worlds, but we have other complex issues, issues of meaning in life that in many cases don't come up to the second part of life. So Jung wrote this very important piece called, or a book called The Spiritual Problem of, of Modern Man, of Modern Human Beings, right? And so Freud focused us on the sexual and aggressive <clears throat> aspects of our instincts. Jung basically said, that's not all. Human beings are very complex animals, and we have to deal with these aspects of the psyche or the mind that used to be taken up in religion and its symbols and practices. Now that a lot of Westerners are not tied to authoritative religions, they're kind of left to sort out these problems of the psyches on their own. And Jung developed uh, a body of clinical evidence with his patients that showed that they had to resolve certain kind of issues and in a way become themselves. Now this is the important term, individuation for Jung that we'll get into. On the way to becoming a full self, there's this process he called individuation. And it meant some things that Freud himself understood. Namely, you had to get separation from your parents. You had to believe you could be your own self and not be burdened with guilt. And that process Jung called individuation because it meant coming to terms not only with your conscious ideas about yourself, but with the unconscious levels of the personality. So like Freud, he believed dreams were the royal road to the unconscious. In dreaming, another part of your mind speaks. And for Jung, when the dream speaks, it's attempting to correct something about the conscious attitude, right? To learn to listen to that other part of yourself that speaks confusingly and, and symbols and obscure feelings. And we have to learn to interpret those messages. So th this, for Jung, is what the process of psychotherapy was to help people along dealing with the conflicts of life. Uh, for this reason, Jung had kind of a, a larger view than Freud in, in taking seriously conflicts about the meaning of life and purpose. Whereas Freud kind of had this model that with proper sexual satisfaction and successful work life and successful home life, you could be a happy person. Jung basically made it a little more complex and said, sometimes we have these so-called spiritual issues that are really conflictual and we have to sort them out, go into different spaces. And David has been showing me you know, in the past six months or so that some of these ideas are being explored in video games made in Japan that are occupying um, a, a lot of the mental space of an awful lot of young people, and yet they're not just about entertainment. And that's the part that I kind of got hooked on. And maybe we'll let David segue and talk a little bit about the video game end of things, and we'll see what the importance of understanding some of these basic psychological theories are. Alrighty. So this is the seek so this is again a continuation of the from what we were talking about in the beginning of our talk with Persona 3. So I'm not gonna give you everything again about what Persona 3 is. Persona 3 basically is a Persona series in general is a series that is a spin-off of the Shin Megami Tensei series, which both deal heavily with religious topics and philosophical topics. Shin Megami Tensei, um, Persona, basically, the, what came from it, was a game that dealed very much with Jungian ideas, had the character of Philemon and such, and had this ability, 
this idea of awakening Persona. So, Persona 3, as I said before, is where Persona got sort of at least starting to be mainstream because of the social system. You go to school in this game. You can take... I'm gonna leave that out. You can go to the bathroom. <laughs> I don't think that that's bad. You can go to the bathroom. It's real life, but uh, but at night you go and fight demons, um, known as shadows, in Tartarus and other places. Or you go into the TV in Persona 4 or in Persona 5. You go into mementos or palaces or jails and strikers. Like, it's it's work life balance basically, uh, in a weird way for these high school students slash um, sometimes in, in Persona 2 some adults. Basically, that's the Persona series, and because we have a union analyst, Hayao Kawai, as we talked about in Persona 5, who, because of his Buddhism, took up these ideas of Jung, and now Jung is well spread throughout Asia. You can see it in BT, the, the song BT, um, Black Swan with BTS, a Korean K-pop group, where they talk about Jung. It's everywhere, and the Japanese are on the flip side of Jung's spiritual problem. They're sort of crying out for the West, in a ways, which I think seem most in Persona 5, but we'll definitely talk about that. Um, so we'll go back to you. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the part, part that caught my mind was hearing that there are video games using these Jungian technical terms like shadow, persona, um, also figures speaking to you from your mind, yes, and you having to encounter and deal with them is really talking about this process of of integration that Jung calls individuation. Right? The basic idea of, of Jung's thought, like that of Freud, is only part of the mind is conscious. That's what uh, Freud called our ego. Uh, we don't want to call it self. We want to call it ego because the ego is the conscious part of the personality. There is other material there. Who is the person that dreams those dreams? Have you ever had a dream when you wake up with horror about what you just dreamt? Like, I don't, I don't have those desires. I don't really want to kill that person. And yet, you dreamed it. This is coming face to face with what Freud first noticed, that sometimes we have very uh, uncomfortable impulses or ideas that we are not conscious of, but reveal themselves only in their dream, in our dreams. So where do we go from there? Do we try to block that out? Do we build a like a Berlin Wall so that no more unacceptable, unconscious ideas can break through? Jung would say no. Freud would say no. They say the way to healing is not to become those unconscious figures <laughs> or listen to their voices and do what they say. Rather, it's to enter into relationship with all of these figures. I'll explain this by reference to the Jungian idea of the shadow. Let us say, I try to be a very good and moral person. I was brought up by parents who told me never to say, shut up, or I hate you, or even to express myself aggressively and maybe hurt someone's feelings. In other words, I'm a really good guy, and I, and I don't want to strike out at anyone verbally, let alone physically. But what happens when I get mad? Do I not allow myself to express that anger? Do I not allow myself to feel any aggression? Well, Freud and Jung would say, if I have such a narrow and tight ego structure that I don't permit any negative feelings in or any anger in, inside me will be building up a kind of monster of anger and resentment. Because, according to psychoanalytic theory, I actually do have those contrary feelings. But I'm not expressing them, so they're repressed. Jung gave a name to a sort of inner figure, an unconscious figure, that kind of bears all those impulses I won't let myself have, right? So, so if I'm, I'm this good guy, never wants to say a harmful word, a hurtful word, represses aggression, even maybe represses sexuality too much so I could barely 
you know, in high school, reach out and touch a girl's hand or hold hands or whatever. Oh, no, I wouldn't want to infringe on her person in any way because I know it's, I've been taught not to be aggressive, blah, 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 blah. Well, the problem there is that all of those uh, co- contrary feelings really are instinctual impulses. When I'm angry, I do want to express anger. When I have desire or attraction, I want to be able to act on it. Right? That's instinctual life. I need to be in touch with that stuff. But what if I'm such a repressor, I never let any of that stuff get through? All that material, that repressed material, that aggression, says Jung, crystallizes out in, into kind of an internal figure, almost like an evil double. Jung called that the shadow. And uh, one professor uh, I had in graduate school as a Jungian had the following exercise kind of a visualization that you could walk through on your own. Sink into your mind, take a few deep breaths, slow inhales and exhales, and then allow to come to mind a person of the same sex that you feel violently negative toward. Right? Is there, does someone come to mind you just can't stand that guy? Like if you're a guy. Jung would say, that's the unconscious part of yourself that you're intent on denying. That's your shadow. Like, like if you have dreams where you've got some like evil characters, like same-sex evil character running around and doing all these things you wouldn't do in your real life, that's the repressed part of you. No, it's not your, quote, true self. But it is a part of the self. And, and Jung liked to talk about part selves, right? And urged that we need to integrate uh, our own consciousness with these unconscious aspects of ourself. Again, that doesn't mean doing their will, right? If, if you have a voice saying, go forth and kill, you know what? Don't. Rather, enter into a dialogue and don't be at the mercy of those forces telling you to do whatever. But see what they're about. Like they're, those voices within you are not you, but they're part of you, like an unintegrated, non-conscious, probably childlike part of you that you need to enter into some kind of conversation with. And what David's been telling me about the various Persona games is that these characters are always being approached by some kind of either wisdom figures or threatening figures from their mind. Well, in the game, they're not from their mind. They're, they're real, I guess, personas, they're calling them, these other figures. Yeah, they're personas. Uh, that you have to deal with. Now, that's not Jung's. It's Jung's term, persona, but, it, but I guess it means like distinct personalities, whereas for Jung, the persona, uh, as a more technical sense of, your persona is your ego personality. It's what you put on to look good to teachers or bosses. It's your good self. You keep yourself in your persona. When I'm, when I'm professor, I'm jolly and I'm, I'm upbeat, I'm friendly. That's my persona. And it's a good and useful thing. And we all need good adaptive personas. But, yeah, there's another part of me which is grouchy, impatient, lazy, uh, easily annoyed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, that's not my work self. That's not my best self. Um, and it's nice that I, I do have a, you know, a pretty solid adaptive persona, right? But the persona is adaptive. It is, it is our workaday world self, but it's not our only self. Mm-hmm. And so the personas can be limiting, right? If you think you're only your persona, then, then you're going to run dry. Because that, that's just part of yourself. Yes, and the good the good news is still, yeah, at least in 3, because that's, that's the one true game I actually played uh, outside of Strikers. Um, the, the fi- when, 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 when the main character switches between personas, the icon for that is the mask. So they still, and in 5, they still refer to like a taking off their mask. But I still think in Persona 2, like when every everyone can switch personas, the idea of the mask is a little better, is explained a little better than... With Persona 4, it's literally just, it, I, it's my true self, or, 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 except, but, or at least ex- it is the shadows being these uncomfortable parts of themselves, but in per- themselves, which they accept and they get their personas. Persona 3, 
think we can start m moving towards, but I think, should we talk about the collective conscious a little bit, or should we go right to Persona 3? Tell me what Let's we Let's talk to. about the collective unconscious. Okay, this is a really hard concept. So we, we have to back up with Freud. The unconscious consists of all of the elements coming from our instinctual life, which means both sex and aggression, right? That's all unconscious stuff that, uh, to some extent, we have to regulate to have a real social life. You know, I I'd like to illustrate it with babies. If you have little brothers and sisters, you have a babysit, you know that little children bite, right? A toddler will bite. Uh, and and if, if you you know if you have kids and you send your kid to daycare, the nightmare is to hear that your kid has bitten another kid, right? Then they'll be banned from the daycare, let alone kindergarten. So we have to teach children no biting. In fact, I think all civilization depends on the commandment no biting. But biting is a natural impulse for for an infant or a toddler, so they have to repress that biting. Uh, which, which is good. It's you, you can't go out in life biting. Still, uh, the impulse to bite remains. There are other impulses. Uh, to be selfish, to grab the biggest portion of food, to eat it before anyone can get to it. Other impulses, when you're angry, you want to hit somebody. It's like the biting thing. Right? Civilization depends on us regulating that instinctive life. And what Freud found was that our unconscious is in a way populated by impulses and by repressions. And Freud argued some very difficult, hard stuff that a lot of people don't read Freud because they don't want to deal with the sexual content of much of what he argued. Now, you can, for Freud, if you haven't read Freud, Get a copy of his introductory lectures on psychoanalysis. That's, these are the lectures he gave to his medical students, and they'll help you get into that. It's a very thin book called Three Essays on a Theory of Sexuality, where Freud runs through uh, this developmental notion of sexuality, where he holds that the, the infant and the young child have something like sexual feelings in all the orifices of the body. Right, babies love to, you know, you see babies suck pacifiers, bottles, obviously attached to breastfeeding. There are sensations in the mouth. Just like, you know, at like a really exciting first kiss, it's like there's kind of an electric feeling in your lips. Right? That's like those are Freud called them erotogenic feelings. And he and he argued that there were three major zones um, where those feelings took place. Orally. Also in uh, your, your excretory functions, sensations, you know, in your butthole, okay, right? Sensations in your genitals, all little children have those. And so they, they do actions that cause pleasure in those areas. That makes the parents freak out a little bit and they're like, don't touch that, right? That made for some sick kids if you clamp down too hard on a child's natural desire to touch its body where it feels good. And yet, you kind of have to tell your kid, no, we don't, we don't just poke around down there when we're in public or whatever. You know, the time and place appropriate for it. Some things, no, you don't want to put that there. Not a good idea. So human life necessarily means some forms of repression, right? And hopefully you get to points when, you know, you get older and you learn, oh, yeah, there are adult satisfactions, right? We can have pleasures. We don't have to repress everything. That would make us some sick animals, right? Because Freud was dealing with a lot of mentally ill, meaning what he called neurotic, young women, because in the in the 1880s, the sexual standards were too strict, right? Women were getting, girls were getting sick because they were not allowed to have sexual feelings and sexual satisfaction. Masturbation was taboo. Um, Parents used to tell their kids, you keep touching that, it's going to fall off, or stuff like that. That created what Freud called castration anxiety, the feeling that like you could lose that thing you seem to love so much. right? And for Freud, that could really haunt your mind if your parents inject that big dose of fear. Luckily, around the mid-20th century, 
Freud's insights had reached the uh, American medical public, and a nice man named Dr. Spock uh, drew up a book called Best Child Care Practices, and he basically told parents, like, don't be real hardcore about enforcing toilet training. Don't make your kids freak out if they touch themselves, whatever. Like, take it gentle and easy, and you'll have kids who have less neurotic hang-ups. That's been helpful. Now, I'm trying to segue to the collective unconscious at Jung and, and not doing very well at it because I'm giving you too much background of Freud's sexual theory. But this is all important for understanding possibly the hardest aspect of Freud's theory to accept, but it's really hard to talk about the collective unconscious unless you go there. I'm talking about the Oedipal complex. All right, this, this is a toughie, and David's been in a class where I've taught this material from Freud. And, you know, it's a little hard to explain that unless you have memories as a kid or if you've had younger brothers and sisters, like Freud's theory is basically that a four or five year old girl or boy uh, will have a fantasy about marrying the opposite sex parent. Right. I remember being about five and thinking my mother was the most beautiful person, the most (laughs) beautiful woman in the world. Um, and you could, and I could see with my older sister had a real love for my father that was somehow different from my own, and so that it's like the child's first models for love are the parents, and because little children don't understand what sex is, they only understand it's kind of a physical closeness and intimacy. Like kids love to be held, they like to play physically. There's a kind of innocence to it. But, but it, it creates in their mind what Freud, um, like, like images, like internalized images of the mother and the father. It, Jung, however, wanted to say that our mind, the unconscious, has more than the images that are laid down in our personal childhoods. He argues that because the human race evolved over millions of years that certain kinds of ideas and symbols began to take on power. Like, why is it, asked Jung, that almost all societies have this idea of a witch, a scary old woman that might have some extra powers, or a magician, or like a trickster-like figure? Right, so what he argued is that there's a level of the mind laid down in evolution that contains all these powerful symbolic elements that are not directly related to your personal unconscious. Like it makes sense in a Freudian view that if I had a real strict father, I would have like this internalized image of a strict father who is judging me. Freud called that the superego, that you've internalized this image of, of a parent with um, very strict standards, you internalize it and enforce it on yourself. And then you feel guilty because you've, if you ever violate what it says. What Jung argued was that this image of our personal father actually has residue from earlier ages of humanity where the father was a far more frightening figure in reality. Uh, developing ideas that Freud had called uh, the primal horde. Freud, following Darwin, imagined that early human groups were were kind of like um, a gorilla or I believe some of the other primates, like where they have alpha males who monopolize all the women to Mm themselves and and drive out the younger sons who become rivals. And for, for Jung, that meant that in our mind, superimposed over our own personal fathers who might be real nice guys is this more frightening image of a primal father potentially dangerous potentially castrating right that that imbues our personal minds personal images of the father with this fear of of the primal father and there are also other primal images a primal mother like the goddess type images one sees in and early statues from the ancient Near East, because somewhere in our mind we equate mother with the with the power of life. 
that, that is both life-giving and perhaps also devouring. Which we'll get to. Right, so there are, there are like <laughs> painfully ambivalent aspects even to good images, like protective father is the good image, threatening father is the bad image. Life-giving mother, feeding mother is the good side, negative side, the devouring mother. Mm-hmm. Right, so Jung argued that these are not related to our personal experiences in childhood, but are residues of the childhood of the human race, where these kind of symbols and relationships become packed with power. And I think this is elements of the Persona game where the characters are are, are relating to other figures of power and trying to get their power. Yes. And and the question is that what what is going on in the game that it is oriented orienting us toward sort of the deep elements of the psyche. Yeah, so so this this was the idea for the podcast is to try to understand how it is and why it is that that these Japanese games are clearly trying to work in concepts from psychotherapy and particularly from Jung's ideas. So, let's go into so we are we are here to talk about Persona 3, so let us go into Persona 3 as a case study of that. Since we talked about Persona 5 Strikers, st- we have talking about 4, but we need to talk about it more correctly. Um, so, for per- in the case of Persona 3, let's start with the spoiler banner and go to the game portion of the conversation. This was much longer than I thought it'd be, but I think this was a good, a good idea to have all of this as backdrop so you truly know what persona is and we can go back to for all of our um, future persona discussions but for persona 3 let us go on to the idea and to answering um, professor cooper's question the idea of persona 3's collective unconscious with the dark hour so for persona 3 we basically as we've said before it, the dark hour is an extra hour of the night where people the, the norm, normies turn to coffins Except for a few Persona users who, ha- who, because they don't fear death, or at least they have access to these Personas so they can fight shadows, which in this game are not of people. They Only in 4 and 5 and Strikers, there are of people. Um, but even in them, there are non-Persona showers, shadows as well. I mean, non-people shadows. The majority of them are not people. But for this, these are only collective shadows. So... I think let's let's put on the spoiler banner for real this time, and let's talk about the perpetuator of the dark hour that is Nyx. So, do you, so for what you from what I told you about, what do you have to say about this idea of the death instinct that that, that perpetuates Persona Three? Aha. Okay. So let's let's back up it. So the character Nyx. Yes. N Y has that spell. N Y X. N Y X. Okay. Nyx. So that's that's really the the Greek word. That's the Greek word for night, basically. So night is the time when the unconscious breaks through in in a psychoanalytic understanding, through dreams. Conscious mind is asleep. Another part of your mind can come alive and express um, the wishes that you keep out of your conscious mind or mm, other kind of impulses. Sometimes it's just memories of the day. Other times it's like desires, right? If you have had a sexual dream about someone and you wake up, you're like, oh my God, I had no idea I was attracted to them. <laughs> that should prove to you the unconscious. Or else like slips of the tongue when all of a sudden you meant to say one thing and something else came out and you're like, oops, embarrassing. Right? So the unconscious has an activity of its own. And that activity Freud held and Jung holds is instinctually driven. But now I'm working on a way to talk about the monster in the room that David just mentioned, (laughs) the death instinct. What is this about? So Freud's original theory was that neurosis came from life instincts being repressed. And by life instincts, he meant on the one hand sex necessary for propagation of the race. On the other hand, aggression necessary to like go out there and get food right go out there and you know try to deal with the animals in the wilderness 
right? So we need, like, aggression is not the same as violence. It's not the same as cruelty. But it's a kind of a, I got to do what I got to do to live. And if that means getting to the fish before the other guy gets to the fish, I'm, I'm going to do it. All right, so, so those things are aggression and sex instinct are like life instincts. Freud began to worry that there was another kind of instinct going on because he encountered patients not only who had sadistic impulses, wanted to hurt other people for pleasure, but they also had masochistic impulses. And some, some of them, and, and they, they weren't all overtly what Freud then called sexual perversions, right? And this is what Freud simply said, define a perversion as in, if, if you like to do a little something on the way to genital in, intercourse, Freud thought, that's fine. But if the thing becomes like the end in itself, not just a leading up to sexual intercourse, it, would, it becomes independent like a foot fetish, <laughs> Right, Freud called that a perversion. The word perversion nowadays is not much used because it sounds like you're saying bad things about what other people enjoy doing. Freud meant it in the sexual sense, or rather in, in the technical sense, where perversion means something's been, and this is a Latin meaning, uh, like twisted up or, or turned up. Something's gotten twisted up. And Freud looked at his patients who seemed to be masochistic, that is to say, would accept pain, would seek out pain in relationships. Like, like, like if you're in a bad, like people can get in bad relationship patterns, so they always go after someone who's going to treat them poorly, disappoint them, let them down, be cruel to them. So you get out of that relationship, boom, bingo, you're all of a sudden in another where the same thing is happening. And Freud began wondering, why is it that people seem resistant to cure? Why is it that people just have trouble abandoning those destructive patterns of behavior even after they've recognized him? He began to wonder if, just as there is an instinct toward life and all living things, there might also be an opposite instinct, something in us that wants to return to nothingness. Right? Freud was aware of in physics, what's called the heat death of the universe, where all uh, motion will eventually cease, and wondered if there wasn't some, uh, some, some analogous drive to that within the human organism. And it became a real sore point in Freud's psychoanalytic school because of a lot of the psychoanalysts in the teens in the 20s, 19-teens, 19 1920s, thought that these, what Freud was calling death instinct, was the result of sexual repressions in society. In other words, people are twisted up because their natural instincts have been repressed. One of Freud's early pupils, who also broke with him, uh, but later than Jung, not until like 19, uh, late 1920s, was Wilhelm Reich, who rejected Freud's idea of a death instinct and argued against Freud, saying, no, you're right, Freud, human beings are destructive, but that's because they're living in twisted societies that won't let them be happy and healthy animals. And Freud insisted, no, you know, there is something that is just human beings have this impulse toward destruction. So it, it's a real point of argument in the psychoanalytic and the different psychological schools. I myself have gone back and forth in whether I believe in the death instinct. At this point, I do not. Uh, but then the burden is upon us to explain how society somehow turns people into sadistic and masochistic individuals despite a basic orientation toward life. So, that's, so and that is exactly what apathy syndrome is. So, you are in, in Persona 3, you're introduced to apathy syndrome very early on with no explanation really what it is. But you, as you observe, you realize that these people are starting to turn into zombies. Not literal zombies, but they are basically, like, losing all the will to live and just all conscious functions. And you realize, and that is the result of the, uh, the Dark Hour, which is... And that is ultimately the cause of this science experiment, which we done by one of the main characters, a rich girl, Mitsuru Kirijo's grandfather. Which I forget the name of the grandfather, but... 
Her grandfather that wanted people to all return to a maternal sense of death, to return to nothingness. So we're going to try to see if you, because there's you, because there is no outside of one time, the Eros, pleasure, has is only really mentioned once, and that is when you're dealing with the lover's arcana shadow, who, who, who goes to Makoto, or the female protagonist who we are playing, and tells you that basically, let's stay in the moment. Life is for now, all of that, and you fight it off to go defeat the lover's shadow. But outside of that, Thanatos has a much larger presence. Yeah, Thanatos is just a Greek word for death, the way Eros is a Greek word for life. And there's a real nice book by a Freudian uh, named Life Against Death. And if you're curious in this, just, just grab that book by Norman O. Brown, Life Against Death. It turned my head inside out in college. So, yeah, Thanatos is uh, Makoto, uh, Makoto's second persona, which you... After, after Orpheus, um, Thanatos, Messiah, Orpheus, Talos, if you're playing Fess or Portable, are, um, you are not p- driven by the plot. They are unlocked at certain times in the plot, but you have to fuse them to themselves. Um, but yes, Thanatos being... We realize you have Thanatos because you're har- you, are, you actually are harbingering the harbinger of death itself, who is pretty chill about that fact and, and, and actually tells you to kill him. And the form that, that Ryoji takes, um, as, I, as I talked about earlier, you can go at in, in the other analysis, but that he takes is of the same, looks just like Thanatos. So, but the villain is Nyx, this motherly figure that, that this motherly figure that turns everyone back to a state of nothingness. So. Aha, she's a female. So that's kind of like an archetypal thing in that, that the Mother Earth who receives all in many cultures is perceived as female, like the goddess Demeter yes. in Greece. Um, uh, so it's sort of interesting that the female, the source of life, is is being depicted as also a source of death. You know, and may- maybe there's something uh, Jung would say archetypally true about that—that that there's a negative and a positive aspect of of the mother image. So let's talk about Jung's response. So for for Jung's response. From what I've read, I've, um, an interesting thing that's going to al- um, align us with a whole, with a very subtle part of this game that is the access to the figure of Messiah and how all and how all of this comes together to Jung's possible answer to why the death instinct is not at least not ever present in our society, why the heroes are able to stop everyone from having apathy syndrome at least for now, and that is partially because I would say um, that's partially because of this idea of hope. The idea of bringing of each of these characters, as I say before, awaken the, the the will to keep on living. And Jung actually stated in this interesting turn in the game because you're you're trying to stop the dark hour, and there's these figure of three characters who are also persona users. They are known as the Strega, Italian or Greek for witch, um, that have been artificially given personas. And they are trying to stop you from stopping the dark hour because they want to live in the present moment because you actually know that they don't have as much time to live, so they want to keep and live in the present moment, and they're stopping you from the dark hour. Once you stop the dark hour, you don't actually stop the dark hour, and and Nyx's arrival is, and you have actually caused Nyx to come and arrive, and now they want, you, now they're trying to stop you from ki- from defeating Nyx. Why this weird shakeup? It's very not causal, but. According to Jung somewhere, I hope this is right because I couldn't find this in Memory James Reflections, but according to one writer, Jung stated that wanting to kill yourself is the same thing as not wanting to die. Do you have anything to say um, about that? Yeah, it, it, it's, that's kind of a peculiar saying, but I, I, I've heard other people express this, other psychologists express this, that the desire to kill oneself is a sign that life as it is now is intolerable, and what you really want is a new life. Yes. But the way appears blocked. Right, so for someone who is suicidal is in a kind of despairing state. They don't believe it can ever change. And if life means this much pain, well, perhaps it's time to say sayonara to life. You know, and just go and pass away. So what is there for the... So in, in, pers- in I guess, is, is there anything in Jung that would point towards this collective death instinct? Oh. 
Well, I, I don't. What would Jung respond I, I to the idea of a death instinct? Yeah, I don't. I don't think Jung accepted Freud's idea of a death instinct. Yes. He, like Reich, believed that instincts were made for life, but when you get, for example, suicidal ideation, what it means is that your life instinct is being blocked, and so life is too painful. It's not worthwhile. Let's back off a of suicide for a moment and talk about sort of common low-level depression exactly. and, and what therapists consider the signs of it. When you cease to have interest in pleasures you used to have interest, when, f- when your favorite foods aren't appetizing, occupations with friends aren't appetizing, your lust instincts aren't finding an object, and you just have no lust for life, right? That's the sign of an inner crisis because it means you've somehow been blocked in all your vital, instinctually driven approaches to the world. And so life is sort of drying up. If a person who's depressed is in psychiatric care, well, in the short term, perhaps it's medication if it's severe. In the long term, it's about looking for spaces where your life instincts can take hold again, right? Because life instincts are basically, if, If you think about it, when you get a crush on someone, you're having kind of a fantasy how nice it'd be, be with them, but you have hope. You dress a little more nicely, you know, looking to meet them maybe before class, kind of hope you might run into them. You feel excited if there's a chance to meet them. That shows your instinctual juices are flowing. And if all goes well, you know, and, and your crush is reciprocated, You know, you start getting involved in a relationship, which is like the life instincts are really moving. Because remember, life instincts want more life. Like biology is kind of blind. It wants reproduction. So it wants us to hit it off with someone, right? So we can reproduce. However, consciously and even realistically, we're not always ready to reproduce, right? Or we're not always ready to get involved in intimate relationships. And yet, it's those things that make life worth living. So the death instinct for Jung, I, I think, is not so much a death instinct as it's a sign that you've hit a dead end. Right? That, that there's, there's a, your instincts are not plugged in, you're detached, and so you're feeling like there's no life in you anymore. And that's a crisis. And Jung always felt like, The life crisis is a point, it's almost like you're going to a low point and then you're going to pop back up. And Jung himself had a real life crisis when he was a professional. He had to, with, he withdrew to a tower. He was having visions. He built a tower. He was a wealthy man by then. He had visions where a figure named Philemon came to him. For Persona 1 and 2. And Persona 1 and 2 took it over. <laughs> And, and, and these figures of his mind drew him out of what was sort of like a temporary psychosis. He had to engage it with it for a while. And he said, kids, don't try this on your own when you're 21. Yeah, Jung was in his 40s. He'd already accomplished his professional work. Uh, he had a family. He was a responsible man, a doctor. So he had space to take out and do visionary stuff. Whereas when I went to high, when I was in high school and college, we were young kids. It was the 1970s. Mm-hmm. We were excited by the ideas of no, we want this visionary thing now. Right? Do, do I want to prepare for my career? No, no, I want the visionary thing. Jung would say, "Hold your horses, buddies. It's not time for the visionary thing. You need to make, get your instinctual life in the world. That is work and love." And the visionary stuff comes later when you're in middle ages and you're having a middle age crisis. You know, that didn't appeal with me when I was young. I'm like, I'm having a, I'm having a crisis now. So I guess, I guess in Gak 2 in general, maybe I can put this in, but the fact that the majority of these games concern high school students. Mm, yeah. What, do you have any comments on that? And they're okay. already going through these. That, that's right. That's right. And that's because our society has made youth last much longer. In many traditional societies, you're an adult by 14 or 15 or 16. If you're a Viking, you know, you'll probably have killed your first man by 14. 
right? Because uh, those are worlds where there's not so much life expectancy, life is not as complex, you don't have to go to college, right? So you become an adult earlier. We have prolonged childhoods. Face it, how many of us really liked living at home with your parents when you're 16 or 17? I was desperate to get out of the house, right? Because we want to be on our own. But <clears throat> we're not mature enough because we've had this extended sort of young adulthood or late adolescence, whatever we want to call it, where we're being told, now, before you, you know, start a job, start a family, you need to do all this professional training, and but you're still kind of a child, and until you're 21, you can't go into a bar and have a drink, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got all this time on our hands when we're, in a way, asking questions that we need to answer. We're, we're, we're needing to find our way among a peer group to be affirmed, figure out who we are, or maybe become who we are, right? And so that leads to these sort of adolescent crises. I mean, I, I personally think that a lot of adolescent crises are about the fact that, you know, we're not emotionally prepared to be adults at the age of 16, as in some traditional cultures. Yes. In the midi medieval period in Europe, kid, the very few who went to college went to college at 14. You have to imagine drunken packs of 14 and 15-year-olds roaming Paris streets, speaking Latin, going to brothels, etc., etc. They're 14, 15, and 16. Right? Uh, it's not that they're mature either, but they've been cut out in the Left, left on their own, make their own mistakes, get in their own trouble. Whereas, because we all have like nice parents who are very concerned for our welfare and you know also attaining professional status, we're taken care of too much. I think we're not. I, I grew up when there was still free-range childhood. You ran around. You could be miles from your home on your bicycle. Nobody knew where you were. Nobody had a cell phone. You had to be home at dinner. But that's it. What was there? Were you packed into wall-to-wall -wall soccer games and this or that and this or that with your parents driving you places? No, you were roaming on your own, sometimes getting into trouble, but sort of getting a sense, independent sense of yourself as being alone instead of primarily doing all these things your parents have lined up for you so you'll get into a good college and then do well in college and then get into the professions and make six figures or more or whatever. And that's, <clears throat> that's the good part about three onward is that there's a social system where you grow and, and strengthen your, your, the main character's personas through being able to have, the, to have these different um, conversations with people in your party as opposed to people outside of your party um, and just get to know people and get to know the world basically through that system. Is it, yes, social, um, it's social life is just to take advantage of people? Yes, but for Jung, I think the, as it happens in the end of the game, the I guess this quote-unquote power of friendship is actually a good thing. It is absolutely a good thing because if, if we think about what friends are, it's the first bonds you make outside your family. And those bonds are important because you are the friend of your friend. It's not your parents who are the friend of the friend. So you're practicing learning to be independent of your family, their values and practices, which for Jung is a big uh, step in individuation. Now that also brings guilt. Like when you become different, or if you realize you're different from your family, you have different values, you have maybe different politics, um, one can feel kind of unconsciously bad about that. If, you know, you can feel consciously bad, but often you can feel unconsciously bad because the rule of, of families is like, you're one of us. Right? And families are a little bit, families can be too tight. You're not like that, because you're one of us. But what if I am like that? Well, you'd better learn not to be like that, but I want to be myself. Right? So you get this internal kind of struggle between a self that is attempting to be born. Right? And all birth involves labor and pain. Right? So there are psychic struggles of youth. Jung commented a lot on the psychic struggles of middle-aged men uh, because he was writing mostly in the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s, and the 50s. Right, but things kind of changed in the U.S. in the mid-20th century. And it seems Japan as well. Yeah, and things in Japan as well. Now we've got very high suicide rates for adolescents. Like, something is not right. Which is what the game deals with. So the game is, in a way, an adaptive strategy on the part of the culture 
to say, hey, there are real crises of childhood, and there are also unknown figures and powers that you might have to learn to deal with. And I think that is sort of true in a metaphorical way. Those unknown figures and powers are, are things in your mind and in your body. And it's also very much uncensored. It is, it, it, it's, I mean, it's high school students, but supposedly it's in America, 18-year-olds, well, maybe most 17-year-olds should be playing it. So it's a very real depiction of what high school life is, not this pretty version of it. Like, there's, yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not a pretty, I mean, it's not horrible, but it's, it's, but it's definitely not Scooby-Doo. Even though Persona 4 is sort of mature Scooby too, yeah, but yeah. but either way, um, let's go on to I guess redemption of okay. of of the main uh, of the main character. So I talked about the awakening, well, the evolutions of the char- of the other characters, but we didn't really talk about Makoto. Now Makoto is not really a character, in a sense. You control him, you give responses through him, but his three personas that he has are very important for not only Jung but Reich. So we have Orpheus, Thanatos, which we've talked about, and Messiah. So would you like to talk about the connection between Orpheus and Jesus? So Orpheus is a figure from Greek mythology who is sort of the magician. uh, Sorry, not the magician, the musician. Right? Orpheus played a lyre. It's kind of like an early guitar-like instrument. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think the, the myth is that he... He, he could charm people with the lyre and he tried to get somebody out of Hades, the Greek his underworld. Wife, his that's right. Eurydice, I believe. Yeah, yeah, Eurydice. That's right. She went down to the underworld. He tried to get her back by by charming all the guards of the underworld with the music. But so, I forget what happened and he got stuck in the underworld I himself. believe he gets stuck in the underworld, yeah. So, now, one of the peculiar things, so let's, let's move over in, in, the, in the Christian uh, mythological setup where, where Christ is crucified and the traditional doctrine is that he descended to the dead. You even say that in the creeds of the Catholic Church and so forth. Uh, he descended to the dead and the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, etc., etc. So Christ went to the underworld. Now, what does this underworld mean when we demythologize it? That is, when we, we take it out of that narrative story-like context the underworld is the realm of the unconscious, mm-hmm. where the dead past is, but the dead past is not quite dead. It's living. So the trip to the underworld in various mythological depictions is kind of like going back to a deeper level of reality that you have to go into in order to gain new life. And in the psychoanalytic process or in Jungian therapy, the ego must explore the unconscious to come in relationship with those hidden figures and powers. All right, so both Orpheus and Christ are figures that for the sake of life, they have to descend to the dead. Uh, Jung wrote a very obscure sermon as a young man. He called it like seven sermons to the dead. Or septem, Even, somorte, uh, yeah. septem sermones ad mortos. Yes, septem sermones ad mort, mortuos. That is to say, seven sermons to the dead. Because he got deeply involved in uh, some kind of mystical, Gnostic, hermetic texts that showed people kind of contact, contacting and being contacted by unknown figures and their lives being enriched by them. So should we should we also talk about the significance of her, of Hermes and Hermetics as well? Well, okay. So so this so Hermes is the Greek god who carries messages. He's got like he's depicted with wings uh, on his on his sandals, and he's like the messenger from Zeus, and he can go to the underworld. All right. So Hermes is like the part of the psyche that can travel to different layers, and so it's sort of useful to have a Hermes friend to keep you in touch with the many layers of being human. Now, there are also some texts from uh, Egypt, uh, written in Greek at the time when when, Egypt had been conquered by Alexander the Great and all their intellectuals are writing in Greek. And this is some great literature. You can find it online. It's called the Hermetica. And, And I'll mention, and Jung was very into this stuff because one of the famous Hermetic treatises begins with a character like meditating 
and all of a sudden a figure appears to him in his mind uh, and says, you know, he says, I am, I am Poimane, meaning the shepherd. I am Poimane. What would you like to hear or do? So you get this thing of like invisible figures popping out and offering to be helpful to you in your quest, whatever that is. And I guess that's where the video games pick up on uh, the, the importance of these kind of almost like guiding figures, sort of spirit guides or what have you. Yeah, these personas, exactly. And and then what about the significance? So that's Junpei's persona, Hermes, and his evolution, Trace Megistos. Oh, okay, so so Herm- Trace Megistos is a Greek word that means thrice great, three times great. And that was just what we find in these ancient Hermes texts. They refer to Hermes as the god of memory and of writing, and they call him like three times great Hermes, you know, just as kind of a ridiculous term of praise, like your royal highness or your imperial majesty. Thrice great Hermes will help you. You know, it's, it's just a way of sort of magnifying the importance of this whatever god guide figure that can take you places where you need to go. And then what about the significance of should we in about well, should we talk about the Dionysian Jesus? Um, well, okay. So this this is getting a little more complicated because there is this god Dionysus who's a god of of wine and drunkenness and unconsciousness, who's kind of a dangerous figure, but yet he's also a source of life. Mm-hmm. So so the the what Jung imagined Jung like Freud believed that. If we were cut off from our instincts, we sort of dried up, and that the mind needs to be in touch with, uh, you know, you know the, the things that draw us into life. And and Jung would say, you know, why is it that I mean, this is something I never understood? People like to get drunk to the point of semi-unconsciousness. Like, like I don't quite get that. I mean, I like to have fun too. But I like to be conscious. Uh, drunk sex is often not very good if you're very drunk. You don't remember it and you're clumsy. But yet there seems to be this impulse to almost like blot out consciousness. And th- this is sort of, you know, and, and there are there are experiences that don't go so far as blotting out consciousness, but they blot out individual consciousness, such as dancing in a group. Um, ecstatic dance, like trance type phenomena. You're kind of getting out of that talking voice in your head and you're just being like feeling and being submerged in the group. And if you're dancing, that's all well and fine. Uh, so long as you don't undertake some group actions where where you're, you know, in a group, you're not the same person. So those, but but there is a desire to experience a kind of death of the individual ego, and being submerged in the group, and that gets called Dionysian, uh, really by Friedrich Nietzsche in his book *The Birth of Tragedy*. But that's a very complex book. But of course, Jung has read it inside out, and agrees with Nietzsche that there are two parts of the psyche: one that wants this depth experience to the point of unconsciousness, another that wants beauty and form. And that life kind of goes back and forth between these impulses, this desire for this Dionysian, uh, you know, you're like, why do people go to raves, right? What, what, what are you trying to do? You're losing that normal, everyday consciousness to dip in the deep well of the life-giving ocean of the mind. You know what? But you don't want to be torn apart by that life-giving uh, ocean or drown in it. You have to emerge as an as a individual ego hopefully enriched by that encounter, right? Not turning into Dionysus, but being enriched by these instinctual powers and able to live as what Jung would call an individuated self. So that's a good place to go to the the method of individuation and then the idea. I'd like to maybe get to Ottoman Modan, but if we can, um, we can t- how, how, the, how I guess this all comes together to the idea of accepting death but not ha- of not having it so much that you want to kill yourself and release yourself from life. It, so have the role of the evoker of putting the gun to the head to awaken what they call these personas. Okay, so, so, okay, so this is... Uh, the place of death in consciousness is sort of interesting 
Uh, because uh, Freud says that when you're young, you don't really believe in your own death. Um, and, and unless when you're young you've encountered death, I think that's probably true. This is why uh, it's mostly young men who engage in very risky behavior. Driving crazy fast, driving drunk, you know, hanging from rooftops, daring each other to do all sorts of stuff because you don't really believe in your own death. When you do, if you've ever experienced someone else's death, whether in your family, a close friend, like a, maybe a, a almost fatal car accident, you're all of a sudden confronted with the reality that life really does mean death. If anyone's read the Epic of Gilgamesh, exactly, right, you'll understand what it's about. Epic of Gilgamesh is about two powerful heroes and best friends. Nothing can beat them. They kill monsters. They build mighty walls to protect the city. Everything's great until one of them dies because of the action of the gods. And then Gilgamesh, who's this great king, all of a sudden life turns meaningless. Like nothing is any worth anything to him anymore since his friend Enkidu has died. So he has to go on a quest to the end of the earth uh, to find uh, the realm of the gods and say, why can we humans have eternal life? I can't stand having to die. Well, in the end, he discovers, nope, you do have to die, but life is still meaningful in the time we have here. Look at the wall, he says at the end of the text. Look at this great city I've built. It's got everything it needs for the people. And the sense is, even if Gil Gilgamesh dies, like the city will live on and it will have had purpose. So it's a way of finding meaning in life w without having to be God, because you can't. God means being deathless. That's, that's in all traditions. The gods and deathlessness go together. Humans and mortality go together. So I guess then what is... Do you think we should get to the spiritual problem before we try to fully answer the question of, of, of Jung's response? To, let's, let's get to the spiritual problem. I think problem. the spiritual problem will help us understand Jung's answer. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the fact that all this started because of a science experiment to kill everyone, but in the good way, not the, evil, the maniacal way. So, tell me. So, why which, which so science experiment are you talking about? In, in persona? In persona, yes. Okay. Per, yes, Mitsuro's, Mitsuro's um, grandfather, who worked and discovered these shadows and just it's Aha, you know, okay. discover the shadows and and create and yeah okay okay so I, tell just but science is mm, bad mm, with you mm, mm. it's not just bad okay this is perfect <laughs> this is the segue so when if you study a little history you know that when human beings in the early scientific period 17th and 18th century first realized that we can plot the laws of physics mathematically mm -hmm. right? this is galileo and newton then we can do all sorts of stuff eventually we could send a rocket to the moon um, we can mass produce enormous amounts of stuff we can whip up a covid vaccine in a year like but when this originally started in the 18th and 19th century, and you got automation and factories and so on, the human race, and this is a period called the Enlightenment in, in Europe, was exceedingly optimistic. Now that we've discovered science, we can fix everything. There should be a science of society that we can make a happy society where everyone will be satisfied. There was all this optimism, wild optimism about the discovery of science. That broke down after World War I, which was the most technological and the most devastating war to date. And all of a sudden, human beings would look at themselves and say, oh my, all our science notwithstanding, we're still like moral idiots. What's the problem here? And Jung had a dream about World War I, correct? Yes, he did. He did. He saw it was coming before it came. The River of Blood, correct? Yes. So Jung realized that the spiritual problem of modern man is that he argued this was a particularly primarily Western problem at the time, was that Western, let's say Euro-American human beings, because we developed technological science, put too many eggs in the rationality basket. We began to imagine we were purely rational creatures and through rational means we could control the world and make a perfect life for human beings. World War I just blew a hole in that. World War II blew an even bigger hole in it. And all of a sudden, we wind up in the mid-20th century, uh, 
and human be- beings are beginning to feel very pessimistic, right? The atomic bomb, you know, it was tried out on Japan to devastating consequences, developed further, uh, you know, total nuclear arsenals. I, I grew up in an age where there were, it's in kindergarten, first grade, and we practiced like, you know, getting down un- under our desk as if that would protect us if there were a nuclear attack and whatnot. So the, the spiritual problem of modern man was that rationality and controlling science is not solving our problems. And Jung thinks that because of all our emphasis on rationality, we got cut off from these irrational and more animal instinctual forces within. Whereas for Jung, it's the relationship between instinctuality and rationality that makes human life able to handle problems. And I think that relates to, so when I showed you Takaya, so who is the leader of the Strega, and sort of put up as the leader of this cult that forms uh, the cult of Nyx towards the end of the game, um, that, that somehow starts popping up in these newspapers for some reason, that he tell, basically says, life lost its meaning long ago. And so why do, why do we have to live every day to sa- savor it when we can all just die? So how do how you respond to that? Right, that's, that's despair. In other words, despair is when you've given up hope that life itself, maybe even a surprising way, will provide you more meaning. I would just say the model is if you've broken up from a love relationship and are very disappointed, you think it's all over, you'll never meet another person again. Yeah, you're going to feel real bad for a few months, maybe a few weeks, a few months, but you will recover and you'll pop back. Like uh, Human beings go through cycles of, you know, mental sort of dryness, but that's almost like something you might need to be in before you get to the other side. But you have to recover hope that there is something beyond what your conscious mind can entertain. And it might even take sort of elements of faith, that is to say things you're not sure of, but to feel, you know what, I'm going to keep on going down this path of life. Right? If, if I die, it's all over. So would you say, in, in a sense, with, with them being told, with the, the, the main characters, the party being told that there's no way to stop Nyx in any way, and, and yet they keep on going after they find in their, 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 their wills to, to, fight on, to, to keep on fighting, would you say that's just an allegory for life in general? Yes, I would, because if Nyx means death, yes, we will all get there sometime. We don't know when, we don't know how. The real issue is, how do you live in that in-between? When I was in college, existentialism was very big. And and I mean the philosophy of Heidegger or Sartre that took death to be like a very basic feature of human life. In fact, Heidegger said that all of life was what he called being toward death. That it's out there in front of us, but we can't let it paralyze us. Whereas if you think that death deprives life of meaning, then uh, you're kind of missing the point. It is precisely death that gives life meaning because if you lived forever, it wouldn't really matter what you did in each particular day. If your life is finite, then it does matter what you do. So then I guess that that basically validates this idea that wanting to kill yourself is not truly wanting to die because, because when you are preparing... When you when you die, you are fulfilling towards death, as you would say. Yeah, I, I think I think it's I think it's really that death suicide is wanting out from pain. Mm-hmm. It's wanting out from pain, and if the only way to get out from pain is out for life, getting out of life, then you'll go for that. But what the suicidal person needs to understand is that there are options, even if you can't see them. Right, so it sounds like in, in Persona Five, or is, is it Five? You got this character saying, "Just, just give it three, up." Three, three, three. Just, just give it up. Just go ahead and die now. There's no point. You know, that's the, you know, the old-fashioned Christianity would say that's the devil. Uh, the psychoanalytic model would say that is a destructive voice from the mind, and it is not you, and you are not it, and you have to kick back against it. Just in the same way as if you heard a crazy voice in your head saying, you know, jump out the window, 
you would kick back against that or a crazy voice in your head saying, go out and kill so-and-so, you'd be like, no. Right, because you are not the voices in your head. They are part of you. You are engaged in relationship with them, but you have to hold your own position. And your position is one of life that is enduring, that can take some pain and suffering and yet come out on the other side. If, if we just think about what people go through, wars or are refugees or horrifying plane accidents where to live, you have to cannibalize the bodies of the dead people, and yet you do because you want to live. The will to live is powerful, strong, but it is possible to get disconnected from it. And do you think there's any significance that Takaya's persona is hypnos? Well, hypnos is, means sleep in Greek, and in sleep, we are given a break from pain. Exactly. And it is also the moment where life forces can come up in the mind. And you'll be in a dream having having some great sexual affair. And you'll wake up, you'll be, oh, dag, I wish that were true. Well, guess what? Time to go out and make it true. All right. So do you think then we, we're starting to get towards an answer of how that Persona 3 is not affirming you um, affirming Freud but actually at least synth- would you say it's a synthesis or would you say it's a rebuttal of Freud of, of Freud uh, okay so you know because I haven't looked at all these things in detail from what you would have, from what, what, we, yeah. what, what I would say is it is an affirmation of the psychodynamic model of personality mm-hmm. maybe it, it, it's more Freud it's more Jung than Freud maybe some elements of Freud and Wright but the main thing is it understands the psyche as a complex thing where consciousness is only part of the story. And that for consciousness to be really alive, it has to be able to have conversation with, dealings with, uh, some kind of intercourse with these other lively figures of the mind. So then I guess I would say, since I guess it's my podcast, I'll give my answer to, I get, it, 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 it's at worst a synthesis, I think at best, a slight rebuttal at least, because I think what we're talking about here is we have a, we have, yes, we are all, we all, no matter what, Nick's will, apparently somewhere in Fess it says that in, during the epilogue of the answer, which a lot of people don't like, I might finish watching it eventually, I'm not going to play, that's way too hard. And I and I portable, so I, I can't play it, and I'm not going to play it. Um, but the answer is weird. Um, but in it, it says that as long as someone wishes for death, Nix will always be alive. D- but yes, you want to go on? Yeah, Sorry. yeah. So Nix is a force. Like death will not be killed, and the wish for death will not. And be the killed. wish for death will not be killed because it is one of the human possibilities. Exactly. But it's not the end of the story. I think so. In that sense, you're right. It is a refutation of Freud's death instinct. It's more like there can be an impulse toward destruction, but we have to learn not to give in to it. Exactly, and that's what and that's what exactly what Persona Three is trying okay, to say: is so how do not get how do it's your it's your little suicide hotline. The game, it's even though it doesn't deal directly like the characters themselves, um, they have these midlife crises, but very much in face of Nick's, also in face of two characters, the death of, of a close friend. They, uh, well, one of them is close friend. The other one wanted to kill the guy, but he realizes that. He, yeah, whatever. You listen to that in the first analysis, but that basically awakens these higher powers and forms individuation. We have here at least that Freud might be right. We have to. Freud is right in the sense that we have depression, and Freud wouldn't even say that the death instinct is collected because his collective unconscious doesn't even exist with Freud. Am I correct? Well, he, he denies it in name, but he admits that there's an instinctual level of the mind that is common to all people. And so it kind of comes down to a pretty similar thing. He doesn't... What, what, where he, Freud did not like Jung breaking from the, the sexual theory of life energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Freud wanted to say all life energy is basically sexual energy, and Jung, and the word for that is libido, yes. for its word, and Jung said, no, no, uh, he thought that life energy was primal or primary and that sexual energy was one modification of it. But there was also spiritual energy, uh, kind of similar to what, you, if, if anyone's familiar with the kind of uh, tantric Buddhism and theories of kundalini where there exactly. are various energy centers in the body, 
Uh, but, for example, in, in tantric sex, the male practices withholding ejaculation on the theory that then the energy goes up the spine, you know, woman having a great time all, all the while. You, you can look up the, the tantric uh, sex poses if you want. <laughs> uh, right? But the idea is that, that that sexual energy can be transformed uh, also into spiritual energy. And Jung really believed that. Freud was kind of like, eh, but it's still sexual energy. You know, so th- it's not as if Freud is all wrong or Jung is all right. It's rather that they're, what they're both working in is a complex dynamic model of the mind where both instinct and spirituality and culture all matter. But what I recommend about it is that it's both um, scientific in that it's based on a biological model of the human person and the data is drawn from... Um, observations during uh, psychoanalysis and so forth, but it's not a reductive model of the mind. It basically says there's no substitute for mental struggles besides engaging with the mind. Yes, drugs are helpful and necessary for some kind of disorders. For others, the real disorder is that human life is complex and difficult, and sometimes you need a guide, which is to say a psychotherapist, to help you through these disorders. Um, but but that the fact that there you do get into trouble in life is nothing extraordinary or strange. It's rather like your own individual hero's journey. Exactly. And I think you want, now is where I will, can answer. We can work together and possibly answering what the so then how effective I guess you the importance of the fact that these that the, that this that these Japanese video games are telling about this such with these complex figures that most people are not going to understand. Um, the Japanese audience will probably, especially Persona Five, saying five, not three, but um, will understand the especially the political issues when we talk about Persona Five. But the ideas of what is going on with these life lessons and how we overcome them is still with it's still for many ways persona for each of these for three four five strikers arena q q2 all these one two all of them have some sort of meaning attached to them for and it, they'll affect you in different ways some people dislike five like four dislike three love three love four love five but in each of their own way or dislike five like royal only with with, with royal but basically, the fact is that is that it will resonate with someone in some way that you're going through some this trouble in your life. There is a way out. Yes. You have your ma- you have a magic partner there that can help you and give you a way in Persona Five out of this prison and Persona and Persona Four to come touch with your shadow. Three, there is hope in life. With uh, death is not everything. Right, but it involves struggle. That hope in life is found through struggle. And struggle that at times may make you sort of despair. Exactly. But you keep on struggling because, you know, life life is uh, life is rough. So I mean, do you have any more questions for me about about? Or well, is, do I answer your question? Well, uh, the point that that <laughs> I'm so interested in about these games, ever since you pointed them out, <laughs> is, you know, they were written clearly by people that had awareness of Jung and had done psychotherapy and thought it was a nice complex model of human existence but but i really wonder what they hoped would come out of it i mean is it just entertainment or are they trying to be kind of like come hither come hither young man come hither young woman life is deep complexities you know you should probably read some books too to get on top of it like like what's going on is it just entertainment well it's definitely i can tell you that per, by the time of persona 5 i don't know the the numbers but i can tell but the, Persona, well, Persona became popular enough for a character to get into Smash Brothers, which is a Nintendo game. Persona 5 is not even on the Nintendo, well, itself is not on, on the Nintendo system, but it found a way to be so popular because Sakurai, the creator of Smash, Super Smash Brothers, loved it so much that he, that he put Joker, the main character, or, or Ren Amamiya, um, as his name is in the anime, uh, um, in, 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 into Smash Brothers. So it got that popular. Wow. It got that by popular. Well, either it's a lot of fun, and the complexity plays a role in that. In other words, why is it? It's it's the hero story where you face challenges. It's always there, but this is a very interesting model for what these challenges are about in terms of bringing in all these either helpful or harmful figures that you're constantly having to manage with. So I think that I I I, I mean. 
I, it, as I've been trying to say, I do think these games, at least for for me, they was it was life. I mean, when I watch the five anime, I know you should just watch playthrough. <laughs> I know people don't like the five anime, but it changed my life. Wow. Professor Cooper here yes, changed my he, life. He's a changed man. I met him. <laughs> I'm a changed man. You introduced <laughs> yeah. me to Jung, and then three years later, I'm like, fine, I'll I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll read his autobiography. And I did, and then I watched the anime, and I'm like... And, and now eh. he's realizing he has to read Wilhelm Reich, too. <laughs> the Mass Psychology of Fascism. And we'll talk about that with Persona 5. We're going to reanalyze Persona 5 in the, in, the, in the context of Reich and Jung as well. Um, Jung's opinion on protesting and changing society as well as a little Um But the fact is, is that these games, at least, they had an impact on me. Um, so, and I think they had an impact on a lot of people. And the fact is that you have these large concert halls with people freaking shouting in Japan that they freaking loving this way. That that freaking culture is, that culture is is as shown in Persona Five, very like in a jail. They they need a way out from from the way these things are. They they as you're talking about in West, they've lost me this religion. Japan is also. I mean, they're they're the most religious atheist country. Like they practice these things. But they don't. But but I don't. I don't think the level of belief is that high. So they've sort of very much rationalized themselves. Well, it's a, it's a highly technological, rationalized society like the U.S. Uh, but but I, I I think the key is is how do we get out of the game and pl- also pl- also play the game of life more effectively because of the game. Exactly. I mean, people always say like sports builds character. So the sense is you learn some stuff on the field and you take it off the field. I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that, that these complex, sophisticated video games with the, with the narrative plots, complex understandings of evil are actually almost like models to how you deal with life. That's what I, I mean, that's what I hope. That's I, I, I hope that, that, that these games are, are not just entertaining, but they actually are life-changing in a way, because these stories are definitely fabulous, and the fact is I just got into this because of you and because of because of my interest in Jung. So I think that, I, I think these, I think that, and not only, these are not the only games that, that do you, they're just the, the most integrative of the use of Jung. And the fact, and they are, yeah. Yeah, I'd say... If you're curious about Jung, read Man and His Symbols mm-hmm. or his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. That's a really good place to start. Yeah. Because where's, that's where I started. If you're interested in Freud, start with the introductory lectures. Great, great read, and he's an amusing writer. He has a, these guys have a sense of humor. Definitely. And I, I guess any final thoughts? Um, well, I just want to thank you, David, for, for bringing me in this studio and introducing me to the world of Persona. Sure, I introduced you to Freud and Young and these other guys, but, but you got me into seeing that the stuff is not only in the books, uh, but is, has made it into pop culture in a way that, uh, that is very serious. Very serious. And, and gets a lot of people going, and hopefully they'll go beyond the game and get into ideas and realize that all these challenges and monsters and allies and friends Right, are, are out in the world where we're kind of playing for keeps. Yeah, and we this is not the end of the Persona 3 analysis. We will d- to get to a, to a talk of the levels of Tartarus and terror management theory and see and, and a talk of, either if it's with someone or not, about, about Japanese suicide rates and depression, which All I think... Right. So, and we got a lot more Persona to come. Persona 4 will come eventually. It's, um, Persona 2 eventually as well. So... I want to thank you, Professor Cooper, very much. You, 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 you really changed my life, and I'm so. And you gave me the world. Keep on going. So, David, it's a pleasure to have students like you. I'll tell you what. Without good students, my life would be real boring. So I thank you. All right. This has been Philosophy of Video Game Philosophy. Adieu for now. Ciao.